in case you missed it, this sermon's about, uh, this, this story's about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> I don't know that I appreciated how many times that was repeated until you read it out loud. Uh, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh, all right. Yes, thank you. So, like I said uh, at the beginning of the service, we're starting a new worship series today, um, again called You're a Character. Um, and we're going to talk about this idea of character um, and what makes up character. Now, uh, we kind of had a rough idea uh, for, for this series, but as I was going through it and trying to put it together, there was something I just kept coming back to in my mind that I just couldn't put out of my mind when it comes to this idea of character. Um, so now you're all just going to have to suffer with it through me, we'll suffer with me through it, uh, uh, about it. And that was, um, I, I couldn't help remember when I was back in high school, um, and um, as may or may not surprise you, uh, back in high school, uh, the friends that I had were not as what you might say like the athletic type, right? We didn't we didn't do a lot of that stuff. Um, every time I'm touring the new high school and I go to we go to athletic areas, I'm like I wouldn't have spent an hour in here uh, in high school. We had other pursuits, um, and somewhere along the way, one of my friends um, introduced all the rest of us um, to this idea of role playing games. Um, the most popular one um, that most people will probably know would be like Dungeons and Dragons. And if you're like picturing the scenes in Stranger Things where they're playing Dungeons and Dragons in the basement, it was pretty much like that. That's just about how it was. Um, but if you're not familiar with the concept, um, role-playing games are basically you get together and um, there is, there's somebody who is really kind of the chief storyteller that tells you what's happened um, and you make up a character. And that character has different attributes. Um, and that is the character that you are playing um, throughout the game. And as you go on, um, those attributes develop and grow. Uh, and if you're doing it well, and you're you, it's something you really can only do in a group, it takes a group of people to do it. Um, and if you're doing it well, and your group you're working with is well, you will have different kinds of people. Right? You may have a character that's based more, you know, more concerned about its strength. You may have one that's more concerned about its intelligence. You may have one that can do magic. Um, you know, all sorts of things because this is a game of the imagination. So you can imagine all kinds of things. Um, so one of the things you do, and one of the things you know, how you figure out what your character is, um, is you have a character sheet, and that sheet has a list of attributes, and there are numbers by each one. And so a stronger character will have more in strength, an intelligent character will have more in intelligence, um, and on down the line. But the idea, and the most important thing, um, when you're putting these things together, is that you have a diversity of people and skills. Because sometimes you need the strong guy, and sometimes you need the magic guy, and sometimes you need the smart girl. Because that's usually how that works. And I couldn't put that idea out of my mind because I really think, thinking about it, I really think that is not, the, the, the reason it works so well in the game, um, and almost all role-playing games are based on a similar uh, system, um, it works so well in the game because that really is sort of how it works in life too, right? We, we all have a different and unique character. Um, the, the thing that makes us us, it's made up of different attributes, and some of us are stronger in some areas than in others. And just because we or you may not be as strong in one area as somebody else, that doesn't mean you have a bad character or a weak character. Um, oftentimes what it means is that your strengths lie elsewhere. And the thing I like about the idea of the game and the role-playing game and having the sheet is it's all laid out there for you, and you know the character you are playing, what their strengths and weaknesses are. I think the challenge we have today is we don't always know or take the time to think about what it is our strengths and our weaknesses are. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks. Um, and we're going to do it uh, with, a, with looking at different characters, basically different traits that make up, um, very, uh, make up our character um, and how those are explored um, in the Bible. So what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at courage, determination, faithfulness, forgiveness, acceptance, compassion, and strength. Now, there's some overlap between those categories, but they are all distinct in their own ways, and we will have a different story to go along with each one. So today, we're obviously starting with courage, um, and as is often the case, this is, courage is one of those ones um, that really lends itself um, to some extreme examples, because when we see or we hear stories of extreme examples of courage, those stories tend to get written down and they tend to get shared. 
right? Because they're usually people doing things that we would oftentimes call heroic. Um, and we like hero stories, and we like heroes, and we like to know that there are people out there who can do those things, um, even if we ourselves are not sure we are capable of doing what they did. So, and that's true in life, and that's also true in the Bible. There are lots of stories in the Bible of people having courage. Um, much like uh, our story today with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in case you missed it. And it is an extreme example. And actually, all the examples we're going to use today are extreme examples, and that's okay. All right. So we're introduced to these, we're introduced to these, three, to these three guys um, who earlier in the book of Daniel, um, and basically Daniel, along with these three guys, um, have been carried um, out of Jerusalem uh, to Babylon uh, when Nebuchadnezzar came in um, and took over. Now, we're in one of those eras uh, in Jewish history uh, where uh, the king, uh, Joachim, I don't know, the king. Um, I should have practiced that. I shouldn't have just wrote it down. Um, but as we talked about before, unfortunately, the Jews had a series of mostly bad kings, and this was one of those actually pretty awful and terrible kings um, in, in Jewish history. Um, he was basically a, a vassal king of Egypt um, and was requiring uh, God's people um, and the Israelites to actually pay tribute back to Egypt, which you can think is like extra humiliating because, you know, that's where they fled from, right? And now their former masters are demanding tribute money for him, and the king is paying that until... Nebuchadnezzar rolls into town from Babylon, and the king figures out, oh, he's actually the big bad. Um, he's the stronger one, so I'm going to change allegiances, and I'm not going to pay tribute to uh, Egypt anymore, and I'm going to pay it to Nebuchadnezzar. And oh, yes, he can carry off a few people if he would like. And some of the people he carries off um, are Daniel and his three companions, and they are actually taken to be in the court um, of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so they're there, um, and they've actually done some good work for him. Uh, Daniel and them have interpreted a dream um, that nobody else seemed to be able to interpret. So they were in good standing um, uh, with the king at that point. But then the king got an idea. Nebuchadnezzar was like, you know what we need? We need like a 20-foot tall statue, and it should be of me, and it should be gold. And then everybody should come and worship it. No ego at all on this guy, right? None. Um, but he decides that's what we need. Um, and so he has it built. Um, and he has them build um, some of it. And it's actually rumored uh, that part of what built the statue were actually some of the sacred objects from the Jewish temple that the king sent um, some of those to be melted down and used to make this giant statue. Um, and then he called everybody together and he said, you all need to worship this statue, um, uh, and if you don't, uh, it's going to be bad. And of course, all of his subjects are like, sure, man, whatever. Like, well, well. But there were a couple that wouldn't do it. Big surprise, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the ones who wouldn't do it. And some of the other members of the court who were jealous of them were very quick to point out to Nebuchadnezzar that, hey, those three guys over there they're not doing what you asked them to do, and you said if they didn't, it would be bad. So that's how we end up at this story, where Nebuchadnezzar seems to like to overreact to things, if you didn't notice, um, and he decides um, that the way to deal with them is, of course, to throw them into the furnace. Now, the, the, the story of them being in the furnace is the one that, you know, is probably the one that is, the, it's the most dramatic, um, and it's the one, if you think about these three people, is the one you think about. And actually, if you think about it, you know, having to, you know, escape a fiery furnace is a rather Dungeons and Dragons-esque scenario, right? So it kind of works, uh, what we're talking about. But I don't know that this part is actually the important part, and I don't know that this part is where you see um, the courage um, that is truly on display, I think it's the part right before that. It's when they're talking to the king. Because Nebuchadnezzar tells them, hey, this is what's going to happen. We're going to throw you in there because I'm really mad. And they respond with, if our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. So they go in with some confidence knowing, or they believe that they can be saved. 
But then they go on and they say, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue you have set up. They don't know for sure what's going to happen. They are not claiming to know for sure what's going to happen. They basically said, if God's going to save us, great. And if not, whatever. We're still not doing what you want us to do. Courage, in its true form, is being willing to act when you don't know what the outcome is going to be. If there is no risk and there is no danger, or you know for absolute certain what's going to happen, then that doesn't really take courage. What takes courage is going into a situation, acting and doing what is right, even when you don't know what's going to happen, and especially if there's an opportunity for it to go bad. I would say that getting tossed into a fiery furnace is probably up there in the go bad scale, right? I don't know it gets a lot more bad than that. But where they show the courage is in this moment here, where they say, we think and we believe God can do this, but he may or may not, but we're still not going to do what you want us to do. To basically have the ability to act and do what's right in the face of the no doubt the fear they must have been feeling. No doubt the uncertainty they were very clearly feeling because they told us they were uncertain. And yet, they still remained strong and did what needed to be done. That is where the courage comes in. And I think it's important for us to realize when we talk about courage, that's what we are talking about. Because there are often times in life we will face situations where we don't know where it's going to go. There are multiple possible outcomes and some of them aren't good. And then we're faced with the decision, do we act and do we do, or do we not? Most people, most people would have bowed down. In fact, most everyone else did, whether they wanted to or not, bow down to the statue. I would argue that for a lot of us, we probably would have been in that group. This is an extreme story of an extreme amount of courage. These guys are definitely you know, up there on number 10 you know, in the scale of courage. And, they, and for that reason, it's a good example for us this morning. All right. So I have a couple more examples. Um, first one um, is I've talked before, um, uh, I've, I've done a couple sermons before um, on my love of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, who was a Lutheran theologian um, during the time of World War II. Um, but Dietrich wasn't the only one um, who was doing that work um, in Germany or other occupied parts. Um, and the, one of the other ones uh, was this guy, um, this is a, that's a, man, it's like a monk shot. <laughs> a, that is an intense looking dude. I didn't realize, okay, when you see it all big, it's like a little. Um, so this is, this is Maximilian, great name, Maximilian Kolbe. He was actually a Franciscan friar um, in Poland. Uh, his father had actually um, fought the Russians uh, for Polish independence um, before, um, and actually he was killed in that. Um, and uh, Maximilian here had a really kind of deep call to faith um, and some deep spiritual experiences early in his life um, and decided to enter um, ministry and enter a, a monastery like age 13. Good go you. Uh, and so he goes and he, he, he becomes a Franciscan friar um, in, in, throughout his teen years. Um, and then he accepts a lot of different and varying positions, um, including uh, being a missionary uh, to Japan. And again, understand this is missionary to Japan in the 1930s. Um, and he actually sets up a monastery there, interestingly, right out of sight of Nagasaki, and, uh, but also befriends uh, some local Buddhist priests um, and, and tries to do some work in an area of the world um, that was actually not very friendly at the time um, to Christians coming and doing that kind of work. Uh, and there are several other examples of him going and doing things. Uh, but when things started to go bad at home, when things started to go bad in Poland, and he could see what was coming, he decided to go back. And so he goes back in the late 1930s to Poland, right before um, the Germans invade. And they invade... Uh, and they take over, and they immediately identify this guy as somebody they're going to think, they think they're going to have to watch out for. 
Because one of the things that their monastery did is they published, they published stuff. They had a little publishing business or thing there. Um, and usually what they published was obviously like religious stuff. Um, and things about the church and those sorts of things, uh, you know, missionary and evangel evangelistic literature and things like that. Well, during the occupation, they actually switched focus and secretly started publishing anti-Nazi uh, propaganda and anti-Nazi uh, uh, publications um, and secreting it out to other places um, from where they were. Uh, this, of course, um, got uh, him arrested along with several others. Uh, and he was held for three months, and then sent back. Um, and then he was released and went back to the monastery. Now, you would think this would discourage him, but it did not. Um, and instead, as things progressed and things got worse and worse and worse in that part of the world, um, their monastery was actually a pretty big monastery. Um, and so they began to welcome in Polish refugees. And at one time, they had 3,000 people sheltering and hiding in their monastery that he was in charge of. Half of those people were Jewish. The Nazis, of course, find out because it's hard to hide 3,000 people. And Maximilian is arrested again, and he is sent to Auschwitz. Yeah. While he's there, three men escape, or they think three men escape. The guards are so upset that they randomly pick 10 people to be locked in a cell and starved to death. One of them, on his way, who was picked, um, started to cry loudly about his wife and his children. And Maximilian stepped up and said, I'll take that guy's spot. And at first they wouldn't let him, and then he insisted. He's like, I will take that guy's spot. And he did. And so he was locked away, and wasn't fed anything, along with everybody else, for two weeks. During that time, he had a quote, and he encouraged people, and he encouraged the ones that, they, that he was with constantly, and he reminded them common, often, he reminded them often, of their need to have courage and stay strong. He was actually the last one left alive, and the Nazis were getting so tired of waiting for him to die that they eventually just shot him. The guy he stepped in place of actually survived and attended in 1970 um, when uh, Maximilian was canonized as a martyr in the Roman Catholic Church. This, again, is an extreme example of courage. We recognize it and we record it because it was unique, because it's not something that most people would do. But it is not unique in the fact that we do see amazing acts of courage happening all the time. So the other one um, was a nurse, actually, in the previous war, World War I, Edith, Edith Carvel. She was a nurse in Belgium uh, when, uh, a nurse in Belgium, when again the Germans invaded there. She helped over 200 um, British and other Allied men escape Belgium after it was occupied. She treated both Allied soldiers um, and German soldiers. She basically treated anybody who would land on her doorstep. Um, but because uh, of what uh, she had done and because of all of that, she was eventually found out um, that what was going on, that she was hiding people and helping people escape. The occupiers did not take kindly to this, and she, along with several others, were rounded up and... Uh, and were to be executed by firing squad. One of the final quotes she said that we have recorded down the night before she was killed was, patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness to anyone. How hard it must be to hold that thought in your mind 
given everything that she's about to go through. For me, these are two of probably the biggest examples, you know, of courage and the willingness to do the right thing, the willingness to do the hard thing, to do the thing that actually doesn't benefit you at all, in fact, quite the opposite, but does benefit others. I think when we are called through Scripture and by Christ to have courage, I think this is the kind of courage he's asking us to have. Now, most of us will never be in a situation as extreme as these people were in. God hopes nobody ever has to be in a position as extreme as these people are in, but we still have opportunities to have courage and show courage every day. I liked, um, I liked Cambridge University's definition for it. I looked at several. And they said it's the ability to con- courage is the ability to control your fear in dangerous and difficult situations. I like that because it's not about not having fear. None of these people claimed that they didn't, none of these people ever claimed that they didn't have any fear. And in fact, quite the contrary. Um, If you look into some of the other writings from these folks and others, you will find um, that they had a lot of fear, they had a lot of uncertainty, they didn't know what was going on, and yet they acted anyway. That is the kind of courage, um, and that, that is the kind of extreme courage that you can see through these folks. So what are we to do with all of this? I think the important thing to realize in all of these stories, both the stories um, from our time and the stories from the Bible, if you look at Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego's full story, you will see they were doing the right thing and they were doing courageous things all along. Same with Edith and same with Maximilian. If you look into their history, this wasn't an isolated incident of courage. Courage was a strength of theirs. And it somehow, I have to believe that they knew it. Somehow they knew um, that they had strength in, in that area or if anything else, it was clearly demonstrated, not just in that one moment, but was demonstrated all along. I think one of the places we struggle is that we don't spend the time, or we don't have the ability, or we choose not to, think about what our strengths are. Because we live in a world that wants us to focus almost completely on our weaknesses. It wants to point out constantly where it is that we don't measure up, or where it is that we may have, you know, where it is that we may not be as strong as the world thinks we need to be. Sometimes that is helpful. What is almost always more helpful, though, is to recognize and understand what your strengths are, and build from there. When we take the time to understand our own attributes of our own character and understand where our strengths are. We, find the, we will find the ability um, to figure out where we can put those to use. It is always better to build from your strengths. Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego already had courage. Edith and Maximilian already had courage. That what, that's what let them do what they did. It wasn't something that just manifested in the moment. They had a strength, and they built on it, and they used it. So throughout these series, we're going to look at all these different, uh, all these different items, And I'm going to ask you to sincerely and honestly reflect on where it is you feel you are in that world. Is something a strength for you? What would it look like to claim that it is? Some of us have hearts that are able to forgive in ways that I simply cannot. Some of us have the determination to continue on with things that I would have given up on long before. So I promise you, if the courage of where we're starting is not resonating, he's like, I'm not sure that's me. That's fine. We will find some that are along the way, I promise. So on your way in, you're actually given a little card. Um, If you're in person, uh, if you're online, you can actually uh, find it on uh, our website, johnstown.church, last character. And you see there's listed um, all the different attributes we're going to talk about. um, And there's a little box next to each one. I'm going to invite you to take a pen, and throughout the week, throughout our weeks together, you're going to fill out what it is you think you are in that area. So uh, we're going to use a, a zero to one scale, or a zero to one scale, that would be very good. 
We're going to use a 1 to 10 scale um, to do this out. 10, of course, being um, outstanding, uh, 9 being excellent. And nobody's a 1, by the way. I don't want to see any 1s on anything. Nobody in here is a 1, I promise you. Um, but, it, you know... Anyway, uh, so as we go through the weeks, I invite you to reflect on yourself, think about it, um, and consider where, is, where do I fall um, in this, and be honest. And typically, when somebody says, be honest, we were concern, we're, we're, the actual concern is the wrong way. Be honest in that if it's a strength, this is only for you. You don't have to show it to anybody if you don't want to. If it's a strength, claim it as a strength. And I think as people of faith who try to walk through the world humbly, as I know most of us do, not me, but you all. I didn't get much of that. You're like, uh-huh. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. All right. Um, <laughs> we tend to want to grade ourselves down further than we ought to. So think about it honestly, and don't be afraid to claim the strength you have. All right, so you're gonna do that. Now, we are also, uh, I'd also like to take an give you an opportunity um, each week um, to anonymously share where it is that you feel like you are. Um, so if you, you probably got a text message or a thing in the app or something with a link, um, or you can go to Johnstown slash search slash character um, and scroll to the bottom, there's a link there for a one question poll that has one number of you which is where do you feel you are um, when it comes to strength? Uh, and we're going to share those results after the closing song. So this is something you can do right during church. So I'm going to assume if you have your phone out, you're not checking Facebook. Well, maybe you are. I don't know. Um, or you're just live tweeting the sermon because it's so awesome. Uh, but uh, but I invite you to do that because I'm curious. I'm curious to see where we are um, as a church because I think what we're going to see, my expectation of what we're going to see is we're going to see a variety of responses and a variety of numbers and a variety of ratings in all of these different categories. And we're going to, that's what I would expect to see. And that's what, kind of what I want to see. Because I think the thing that makes us, this church strong is the thing that made the part, my party strong when I was role-playing all those years ago is I believe that one of the things that makes this church strong is we have a diversity of people with a diversity of strengths. Most of you have really good character. <laughs> but those character comes in different forms. Because we have that diversity of strengths, there are folks we can turn to for one thing and folks we can turn to for another. That's what makes us great because we are pretty darn good around here, I would like to tell you. And my guess is, even amongst your families or your friends, you're going to have a diversity there too. Because life is really boring when we're all the same. It's far more exciting when we get to hang out with people who are a little different than us. So consider, where are you? Do you feel? How can you look back on your life at times when you had courage, and maybe were able to do something most people wouldn't, maybe this is a strength for you. Or maybe one of the ones further down the line is where you will find it. No matter what, we can trust that God has blessed each and every one of us. God is touching each and every one of our lives. God's spirit dwells within us. And even if we are not, God is trying to use the strengths that we have to do his good work. Amen.